world record. It's going to be tight. He's looking for the stadium record as well. Radisha, step by step. Oh, it is! He cracks the world record! This is the man to take the 800 meters to a new level. Is it going to be a world record? He's done it! Oh, that's incredible! None of them are good enough to hold on to Radisha. We have something very, very special on here. It's a world record! A world record here in London at the Olympic Games from the greatest middle distance runner we've seen for a very long time. David, you were born in 1988 in the Rift Valley, known for its high altitudes, uh, rough terrain and hilly nature. Tell me about your early days. Well, uh, I was born in uh, Kilgoris. Uh, a small uh, uh, town in uh, in Narrow County. That is where I grew up uh, with my parents and my uh, other elder brothers and sisters. I used to like running every time, and uh, every time even they send me to go shopping or bring something in town. Uh, I, you, you, you barely see, uh, see me walking. Every time I was just running up and down. Uh, your father, Daniel, was also an athlete. Uh, 1968, he was part of your team, the 4x400 four meters relay race, silver medal. Was he a big inspiration in your life? Yes, you know, uh, as a young boy, I grew up uh, and I wanted to be like my father one day. And uh, um, as I was uh, in my father's uh, house, uh, I was a little bit, I was grown up a little bit and uh, I was able to uh, to few things and I was asking a lot of questions and uh, one day I came across and I saw his uh, silver medal uh, from Mexico 1968 so I was uh, amused and I asked him what is this because I just saw it's just something like a, a, it's just like something like a medal you know but I didn't know exactly how to how he got it and uh, how do somebody get uh, such kind of stuff. Lee Evans for America way in front. They're 30, 40 yards in front. Kenya next, West Germany next, Poland next, and Great Britain I don't think will make it unless the others have gone too fast too soon. It must be a new world record by quite a slice. Kenya still in second place, West Germany third, Poland fourth, Great Britain fifth, and that's the way they're going to finish, although the Poles could get third place. America wins. I remember I liked it and every time I can go and touch it because it has a lot of uh, very beautiful inscriptions in it. So uh, he told me he used to run and that is uh, how I came to know about him. And uh, I was a young man who uh, had passionate and I wanted to be like my father. So I love everything to do with running every time. Uh, when I get out there, I want to compete with my colleague. Uh, we make fun, even in school, when we have this physical education. I always like to be there. I wanted to be in the front uh, park. So I, I think he, my father played a very big role in my career as a young person. David, you come from the Maasai ethnic group, known for its bravery and still nature. Tell me about this culture. Well, uh, Maasai is, uh, is a very unique uh, tribe here in Kenya, and I can say all over the world. One is that uh, we are people who live uh, alongside with the wild animals, and uh, we keep uh, herds of cows, uh, sheep, and goats. Mostly we have a lot of activities to be do, to, that we do there. Uh, and we have a lot of ceremonies that we celebrate, and we love uh, having uh, music and jumping in a special way. Uh, we just live in a mutual relationship because they also know us, and they know uh, we are tough, we are brave, and we don't fear them. And, uh, we have that kind of respect between the, the Maasai and the wild animals. In 2006, uh, that was the same time I was in Form 2. And uh, uh, that was the year I met uh, my first uh, team to represent my country abroad uh, and internationally. Um, because I tried to, uh, to, to, to do my best uh, the previous year, 2005, 
and that was the year uh, was the World Youth Championships in Morocco, Marrakech. But I didn't make it. I was fourth in the in the final. So in, I came back, and I knew I had to do more training and fix a lot of things so that I can be re I'll be ready in the following year for the World Junior. And going to the final, I was actually. Uh, almost uh, if I can run my time, my best time, I was almost number six and I was like wow what is going to happen in this final but uh, during that race uh, I managed it well, we meant uh, we, we, the pace was a little bit slow and uh, coming to the last bend I just flew with my long stride and up the pace, the speed, and uh, I won it, but I couldn't even believe it when I crossed that line. I was just like, wow, it's unbelievable. And I remember very well that uh, after uh, my race, uh, the way and the smoothness I was running, uh, the Chinese uh, people nicknamed me uh, the pride of Africa. In 2008, I was in my Form 4 uh, in high school, and at that time I was uh, a little bit mature, and uh, I, I did some few races in Europe and I was running well. So we were expecting and we had uh, a lot of hopes that I can make uh, the team to represent uh, my country in the, in the uh, Beijing uh, Olympics Games. But unfortunately, a few weeks uh, before that, in one of my competition that I was running in, in, uh, in Europe, Ostrava, I, I pulled my, uh, my uh, Achilles tendon. It was not that very serious, but uh, it was a precaution that I should not uh, continue with my training and, of course, uh, competition because the risks were I might even damage it more. So I had to be patient and, uh, you know, I learned a lot of things from there. Although uh, my coach also, Brother Colm, was uh, very uh, motivating and encouraging. And I remember the word that he was telling me, don't worry, Rudisha, you're still young, you're in high school, and uh, you've got a lot of years uh, to run. And I think the years ahead of you is more important than this. So just be patient, everything will come at its own time. After missing uh, Olympics in 2008, of course, uh, I really focused and uh, uh, wanted to be in the World Championships the following year, which was in Berlin 2009. We ran the heats, everything went okay, I won my heat comfortably, and uh, the following day was the same. Sometimes I find that I am not good and I don't like uh, raining and cold weather. So it happened that uh, during that race, uh, I wasn't that very confident because when it just rained, I usually don't feel confident uh, during that uh, during the race. So when the race, uh, the gun went, I ran my normal race that I used to, to to run, running from the park number two, number three, just to be on the safer side. Uh, the race was slow, very slow, and coming to the last bend, the guys were just a few meters, like two, three meters. And coming to the last bend, everybody was kicking because the pace was slow. Everybody was strong in that last hundred. And when I tried to, to also accelerate, I find that my legs were not moving. Rudisha trying to come up on the outside. The Cuban 400 meter specialist making a late surge on the outside. Lalu is going to take it. Who's going to get second? Rudisha just overtaken by the Cuban Lopez on the line. Brilliant run by Lopez to get through in second place. Two of the big favourites have been eliminated. Rudisha and Reed are out. It was tough for me because I couldn't believe I was in good form, expecting even to, to win a medal, if not win a gold. And since then, I think I changed my attitude and tactics because uh, I knew I was in good shape. I said even if I was running from the front, maybe I could be able to secure uh, to the final. But because I ran from behind and toward that last bend, everybody was strong in the race, I couldn't make it. That was the last race I ran from behind. And then I started from there. The, the, the next four races, I won from the front, including even the champions who won the world title in Berlin. He's got the gas, he's got the confidence. 
David Radisha coming away for victory here. It's not going to be as fast as he did in Rieti. David Radisha is going to win. Gary Reid in second. Malazzi, the world champion, had to settle for third. And from there now, I got my tactics running from the front. And I think from there, I saw a lot of change because I knew running from behind, I was holding myself. I was not giving the best. And that year, I closed with Africa record. I broke the Africa record that stood for over 23 years. I told my coach, uh, it's always tough to run from the front. And especially when you want to push to the world record, sometimes you never know the pace that you're going. And uh, if you run from the front, you probably if you are not strong enough, you will become uh, other people's uh, pacemaker. So I went to a very small meet and um, I ran my first uh, 141.51, I remember very well. And uh, since then I knew uh, just a few things to do and I will be uh, with a world record. So I came back and uh, we did uh, good uh, training. I re we had uh, Africa championships here in Nairobi. The first time I ran uh, very, uh, an altitude record of 142.84. David Rudisha, the man to beat in this one. The uh, African record holder at the moment set a smashing time a few weeks ago in Belgium. As the Kenyans expect to dominate this race. Bernard. Oh, it's a quick start to this race with Rudisha going straight to the front. Right from gun to tape, uh, on my own without a pacemaker, and that really motivated me. I knew if I can do 142 without a pacemaker, then you see I was getting my uh, rhythm and my balance very well in 800 meters. So the year was a uh, great one. It's Rudisha who's open up a massive pace there. He's got five steps ahead, and Afra Kira is in the second position, just following closely there. Kibuba comes into the third position now. Rudisha is running for world record time here. Look at that sprint that Rudisha has employed. He's got the world leading time, and he's now looking for a better time. It's Rudisha. Is he going for the world record? 137, 139. He's got 140, and 142 is what he makes it. 2011, yeah, it came back again, you know, world championships. Uh, whereby I was disappointed in uh, uh, into in, uh, in in 2009 in Berlin, but before let me go back a bit. You know I have uh, a lot of memory uh, with Berlin, and uh, you know after getting disappointed in Berlin in 2000 for the World Championships, uh, the following year 2010 I went back to Berlin, and I remember very well that uh, I said this is the same track where I was uh, eliminated in the semi. I didn't even get uh, to, to go to the final. And uh, I told my coach I want to do something special here. David Radisha racing against the clock. Can he break the world record? It's going to be tight. He's looking for the stadium record as well. Radisha, step by step, and he cracks. Oh, it is! He cracks the world record! Radisha makes history in Berlin. And I remember uh, very well that uh, this, that is the track that I broke my first world record. So from there, uh, one week later, I went to Rieti, a small uh, city in Italy, near Rome. Uh, I improved the world record from 141.09 to 141.01. Uh, a span of only eight days so it was uh, unbelievable my coach was there I was watching live and uh, it was a great moment of my uh, career and in 2011 uh, the most important thing was to win that title that was my most important thing because uh, the previous year I remember I was being asked a lot of questions everywhere I go especially uh, with the uh, journalist that uh, Rudisha is just a fast athlete, but he cannot manage or he cannot handle the uh, championship pressure. So uh, that year I was going there and uh, I really didn't want to make any mistakes. So I knew I was strong and uh, now that uh, I'm also 
uh, who I was uh, at that time the world record holder. So at least that was also another added advantage on me because my colleague will just feel like, wow, this guy is, uh, is tough and if we can push uh, or even try to disappoint him by going uh, in front of him during the, the craze of competition, maybe he can even destroy us. So they were more like accepting every, any pace that I can take them through. So I controlled that race. And I remember I passed the first 451, very nice and comfortable, because I wanted to have a strong finish in order to secure me the core position. The Dishart goes again with 150 meters to go. Pouring it on, is he gonna go away? It looks as if he is. That was a great tactical move for the big man. Bozakowski is coming hard though. Kaki is trying to catch Bozakowski. He may just get it for the silver medal. Radisha gets it. Kaki second, Bozakowski third. But a commanding run from this, the greatest 800 meter runner that we've seen so far in this century. London, I can say, was uh, one of my greatest moments in my career. And that was my first time to be in an Olympic Games. And then two, my father was an Olympian and they won silver medal in 4x4. Four four. And every time I used to tell my father back at home, you know, you are growing old now, but you know me, I have a lot of uh, opportunity in future, and maybe then I can better your performance by winning gold in the, uh, in the Olympics. Because I, can t I, t I used to tease him that you cannot change anything now because you cannot go back on the track. So that is uh, another thing that I was, uh, was going on in my mind, that I have to do something and even better uh, our performance. Uh, three, um, in 800 meters history, there was no athletes who have uh, uh, hold three titles at the same time. At that time, I was the uh, world champion, uh, world record holder, and I was missing the Olympic uh, title on my table. So, um, I, if I go back, uh, there was one of the special uh, uh, conference that we had. Uh, there were four of us previous uh, Olympic uh, world record holders. That was uh, uh, Alberto Wontreina of Cuba. It's still the Cuban in front. The little American second. In third place is Van Damme. Fourth is Bullback. And over right out of it. He's not going to be able to get there. And Wontreina holding off the American who's broken. Van Damme trying to get to Volhuta. But Cuba's first ever gold goes to White Lightning. A new world record for the man who is still a baby at the event. Lord Sebastian Coe. That lovely free action. And now he's really got to hurt himself and is beginning to hurt as well. Driving for the tape. No sign at all of weakness in the legs. Maintaining good form. And according to our watch, he breaks to Mr. Photographers. He's inside 142, a new world record. And Co, we believe, has just run himself once more into the pages of athletic history. Uh, Wilson Kipketer. Under 200 to go, and he's looking good here, Wilson Kipketer. He blew the opposition away in Athens. He's blown them away again here, but can Myself. Radisha down that home straight, stride for stride. It's going to be close, and he's just oh, he's done it! Well, oh, that's incredible. His second world record in a week. And uh, there was uh, one question that was thrown to all of us: that uh, uh, why did they won uh, only uh, the, 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 the two guys? Why didn't they won the uh, the Olympic Games? Because uh, I think uh, Sebko got silver and also uh, Wilson got silver. None of them got uh, gold. 
So um, I think they didn't answer the question, but they said, I think we have the right person here who will, who will answer uh, this question. So uh, I think they, they had me another pressure on my shoulder. But um, nevertheless, you know, I did uh, one of my best preparation that year. Uh, my training was just perfect. I didn't have any problem with the injury, starting from the beginning of the season all the way. So that was uh, the best thing that happened to me that year. And going there, um, I was very much confident, because uh, at that time, um, I just used to think about my race. How am I going to run? Because I was a front runner, there's no much I can think about about my colleagues because uh, now that I changed my tactics, I'm not mixing up with them, uh, pushing, getting boxed in. I was just running my race and my time. So the most important thing, even during my preparation, was even sometimes I can take off my watch and just run and you know some splits on the track just with my mind and you know just feeling that i just want to do like even if it's 200 i want to do 25 seconds and without timing i can just get that 25 seconds so i get a very good feeling of my splits so going to london uh, that night uh, 9th of august uh, the last person I spoke to was uh, my manager and I told him I am going to run and I'm going to cross the first lap in 49. I don't know what will happen after that, but I'm going to cross my first lap in 49 and then see if I can push. And my target was to break the Olympic uh, record uh, that uh, stood for since 1996. So um, I was very much confident in that final. I was not nervous and I didn't want anything to distract me. I just wanted to run my race the way I planned from the front, crossing the first lap in 49. It's Rhodesia coming up to 400 meters. Let's take a check on the time. It's quick, very quick, 49.28. That Olympic record looks set to go. Now I push the engine even more harder. I, I remember the split that I did very fast was the third, uh, third 200. I think I destroyed most of the guys there. None of them are good enough to hold on to Rhodesia. But when I look at the clock, I saw I have pushed this race. I think I'm going fast. But I'm seeing my colleagues there just behind me. They were, there was no big gap. So I was like, am I not doing enough? We're going to be looking at the time very closely on this one. A brilliant run by the youngster Amos as he comes in the second place. The other youngster, Keaton, is in third place now. Then a man, the three youngsters, with uh, Solomon finishing. But Rudisha, what's the time? It's a world record! A world record here in London at the Olympic Games from the greatest middle distance runner we've seen for a very long time. It's David Rudisha. 140.91 is shown on the clock. It was unbelievable, world record 141, without a pacemaker, you know, right from gun to tape. And everybody in that race did amazingly uh, unbelievable because everybody almost was rewarded with something, personal best, national record, and the last person running under 144. He ran it all the way, he doesn't need pacemakers, he can do it himself and he's proved it here and to do it in the final of the Olympic Games is quite incredible. One minute, 40.91 is astonishing, absolutely astonishing. He, was, he promised it and he delivered it. I think uh, even uh, Sepko after that said that uh, the race was one of the best, it's the best 800 meters ever. And even his comment after the games, he said, uh, Bold was good. Here comes Usain Bolt! Usain Bolt storming through! He takes it again! Blake gets the silver! 9.64! Oh, he's retained his title in the most emphatic way! But Rudisha was magnificent. One of the great Olympic moments which will go down in the annals and be referred to for years and years to come.
This man is the best. And quite extraordinarily, the runner who came eighth, his time, he would have won the three previous Olympics. Uh, after the end of that race, you can see everybody smiling and everybody was just happy because even the last person, it ends his personal best time. And I usually say, even if I become last today and I run my BP, I will have nothing to say more because I've run my lifetime best. So um, I think, you know, because of the smoothness and the balance I usually run in most of my competition. Uh, during that year, uh, since uh, that year 2010, all the way 2012, uh, when I was running my great times, I think I track most and many athletes to run their BPs. So that success was contributed with all of us because they were also behind me, pushing me hard. Even myself, I go from time to time uh, and watch that race on YouTube. Sometimes I feel like maybe it was not me who was running that night, but because of uh, the preparation, the training that we did, and we just make it look the way it is because that is what we are trained for. And uh, if somebody has look at it, it's like an extraordinary uh, so, uh, piece of an event. David, the 2030 World Championship, you miss the event, why? Uh, we went for a medical checkup, we went for MRI, and uh, there was a bone bruise. So we had to stop and um, we were advised to take three to four months without doing anything and see if it can improve. And you see, because we are already starting the season and three months is the whole season and in the next season. So it was uh, very tough and difficult for me. David, you make your comeback in 2014, but it doesn't go all that well for you. You come second the Commonwealth Games. So Radisha is leading, but look at Amos. Can he do it? They're side by side, and the Botswana has produced a famous, famous victory here. He threatened to do it, and he's produced the goods. Amos beats you six times. Amos looks dangerous. Boss is still having a fabulous run, and Rudisha looks behind and sees he's there and has to kick here. And Amos on his shoulder will fight and scrap. Aman still can't get to the front three. Amos moves onto the shoulder of David Rudisha, who has a look and says, Who's there? And now he realizes Amos kicks away. And this is a brilliant run. Aman finishing incredibly quickly, coming from so far back. Boss is going to get there. Perhaps as well, and Boss is trying to make it up, but Amos gets the win. Round the top of the bend, and David Rudisha, it looks so far with 120 to run. Right normal services resume. Rudisha into the straight now. Can he be caught? Amar kicks, tries to get past him, and does. Eases past him. He's not the finished article yet, but Amos it is up front now in the red. Amos having a brilliant run here, takes it at the line. Rudisha easing back in the throttle over the last 30. It's been a solid run for Rudisha. I think he ran about 750 really well. But we now come to 2015, in the World Championship. Tell me what happened there. Well, um, when I came back in 2014, this, uh, after I had a keyhole uh, surgery on my right knee, um, it was quite tough because getting back into training um, I started in uh, I started in December, uh, training slowly. That was in 2013, and then I realized that it was not just wa not it was not working. So I had to go back to Europe again for the rehabilitation for almost two months, uh, and then I came back, start my training uh, toward the end of uh, February, and uh, it was quite uh, short for me. Uh, I cause I just prepare myself for about two months and then I started competition. So uh, I try my best. I was still feeling a uh, pain in my knee, in my knee. So of course, uh, when I was out, when I was away, the young men took over. You know, they dominate 800 meters. So when I was coming back, of course, they really challenged me. They, they, and they were like, hey, 
come on, you went, so why are you coming back now? We are the owner of this house. 2015, the World Championship, your arch opponent from Botswana, Nigel, has beaten you six times. Let's get to the final of that particular race, the World Championship. A few weeks, like three weeks before the World Championships, as I was training, uh, I did a few speed uh, session and I feel like my legs is ready. Is, there's no problem after and I was not feeling it during the, my training session. So I focused on my speed and I knew that was my weak point that uh, I used to be uh, beaten by this guy because I was coming with them very uh, uh, nicely, uh, you know, during the race. And then in the last hundred is where they, they, they find my weakness. I didn't have that acceleration speed. And when I got that, then I knew um, on a safer side, going to uh, world championships and going back to where I first uh, won my major uh, a world a junior title in Beijing. I was very much confident and I knew, of course, this one I also have to play with my tactics. Uh, I know, uh, they know that I can run from the front and win my race. And as well, uh, what they didn't know that if I can, I can go slow, I can still win my races. So I confused them with that. Look at that, the slowest by far of all the heats <laughs> from the Olympic and world record holder. So during that uh, uh, semis and heats, I was just taking my, uh, you know, my first lap quite very easy. And then in the last 200, I just accelerate. I had the speed, I have everything and win my competition. But in the end, it's the maestro himself that takes it easily. Rocic in second place, Bala there, and Riba in fourth place. So these guys were confused and they were like, maybe he's conserving uh, energy for the final. Maybe he's gonna destroy us like what he did in London. But in my head was, I'm going to control this pace. And then in the last well, 200, in the last 150, I'm gonna release my handbrake. It's Radisha, down the back straight, the Olympic champion, the world record holder. But on his shoulder, Rocic, and look at Adam shot. He's trying to find a gap on the inside, but it wasn't there. No, he wasn't. Radisha kept him at bay. Radisha now pushing hard. Lat -lat, those long strides coming ahead. His teammate, Rocic, is on his shoulder. At the moment, it's now Damien Radisha pulling ahead. Shot is there, coming fast is Tuka, but I don't think he's coming fast enough. David is doing it, he's moving away. Shot is in second place. Tuka's coming through fast in the end for the third place. But the big man does it, that wonderful last lap again. The arms go aloft. So, um, I think uh, that is the confusion. And I remember, I never wanted to tell anybody about that. So I play a little bit with their mind. and. Uh, after the race, uh, nobody could imagine that I, uh, I can win the, the world title after coming from such disappointing year with injuries. David, your extraordinary coach, Com O'Connell, a missionary, he comes to Kenya in 1976, supposed to be here for three months to teach geography, he stays here and he becomes your coach with no coaching background. Well, uh, you know, uh, Brother Colm uh, is the best coach. So it happened that we came to Iten and uh, during that, uh, that uh, the competition, uh, we were staying at the famous uh, high school. And um, that morning when I woke up, I saw a forest of trees planted by famous athletes that I knew that were great athletes who have represented Kenya. Uh, lucky enough, uh, Brother Kulm was there and he was watching uh, the competitions and I think he saw me running 
although I was not vanished. I was just running, you know, with, without training. So I was more naturally, but I became fourth. So the following year, he started following me closely and he invited me to St. Patrick camp. And then I said, wow, um, it's, up, it's a coincidence because at that time I was saying, I wish I can make one day to be in this camp and be trained by him because I know if I'll be trained by him, you know, I said probably I'll make uh, to become a successful athlete because of what I've just seen there. And uh, I had no doubt if one day I'll come in contact and work with him, I'll, I'll succeed in sports. It's, uh, it just happened like that. In 2006, I was in Form 1 and uh, I joined Brother Colm. And that is where now uh, he trained me and he saw the way I was training with long stride, the power, the stride, you know, the smoothness. And he told me, I think you can do better in 800 than in, in, uh, than in, uh, than in 400. And he was the one who made me run 800 for the first time here. And I did uh, a time trial at the end of the camp. And I won that uh, race and I ran uh, 150 which was uh, unbelievable, unbelievable first time for the first time as a, as a youth. Uh, I think that motivated me and since then I started running 800 but I never left 400. I also used 400 just for speed, for improving my speed in the 800 meters. And he's been your coach from day one? Yes, he has been my coach since, and uh, since we have been working very well, and we have been seeing our progress, um, without any doubt, as you say, I don't know if I was training with another coach, if I could have been where I am today. So he is uh, he's, he's, he's a great uh, man, he's a motivator. You tell an extraordinary story. You come to Kenya, you're a missionary from Ireland in 1976, you're here for three months, teach geography, you're still here, and you're producing world champions. Well, I came uh, basically to teach and to work among the youth. I landed on my feet when I came to Iten in the sense that I came to a school which had a fantastic tradition for sports, a support for anybody who was willing to take up the coaching or the training of young people in sport. And um, I had a sporting background myself, not in athletics. Now, E10 at that stage was only a crossroads, basically. It was only a school. Uh, there was very little else. Um, it was very remote in the western highlands of Kenya. It was um, uh, no water, no electricity, no telephone, all these facilities that you would associate with today's world. But I came from a rural background in Ireland, so it wasn't so different in a sense. Uh, for me to adjust to the Kenyan way of life. And uh, it, Kenya did have a, a, a tradition for it, as it's at the time, right after independence, they won their first Olympic medal in 1964, went on to win their first gold medals in 1968. And there was a great group of Kenyans who had led the way, people like Kipchoge Kaino and Naftali Teemoinos Biwat, all those had won Olympic gold medals before I even came. Um, I came to an area which uh, was very much aware of athletics. I took up a sport which didn't cost very much. <laughs> Most of the kids ran barefoot. Uh, so you didn't need anything really to run. And I was given the fantastic opportunity of working with these people who would appreciate very much anything you did for them, regardless of your knowledge or your experience. Once somebody um, uh, came on board and associated with them, uh, they were really enthusiastic about it. So I began to work on the, the athletics team in the school, uh, largely through trial and error. Uh, in a sense, maybe if I had to come very knowledgeable with experience and maybe degrees in sports science, the probability is that I would bring a European system of coaching. And remember when I came, middle distance running, the kings were the British. Sebastian Coe, Steve Ovet, Peter Elliott, Steve Cram. So, in a sense, they were the ones to base my training and on and use them as examples. But uh, in a sense, because I knew very little, I was very cautious. 
and I became a good observer. I watched, I looked around, I saw what works, what doesn't work. So in a sense, I created a system made in Africa. It, it came from inside the African culture, inside the African mind, inside what was already on the ground. And I, I came also at a time when you could say the athletics morale in Kenya was low. Between 1972 and 1984, Kenya had no Olympics, no Olympians. They boycotted 76, the year I came. 1980, they boycotted Moscow. So I got that little wind of opportunity to experiment. There wasn't any great pressure to produce Olympic medalists or world beaters. And in fact, the few Kenyans who were really on the world scene at that time were in college in, on track scholarships in the United States. So, there wasn't a whole lot around Kenya at that time. So in that sense, uh, th th that opportunity, I grabbed it with both hands and got the chance to build up my own experience, my own knowledge from within. I didn't really learn what you might say the technical or the formalities of coaching until 1981. But at that stage, I had already a very good school team. I'd already had some success locally. I really didn't have any great knowledge of how good they were on the international scene until the mid-1980s, till we had World Junior Championships in Athens, and then later on, I had, uh, my first Olympic gold medalist was in Seoul in 1988. Cherry is making an effort, but it's Rono in front, and are they going to catch him? Harold comes through on the inside, and here comes Glenn with a late run. It's Elliot, Elliot chasing Rono, but he can't get there. Rono wins, Elliot second. Peril third, Graham four. And what a run that was by yet another good Kenyan. So I was very fortunate, but I suppose in a sense, I, 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 was, I, was, I was enthusiastic about it. I was willing to, I, 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 to take on the challenge and see that this is an area that young Kenyans can excel in if given the opportunity and given the encouragement. And I suppose I was the right man in the right place at the right time. Come explain this to me. We're at high altitude, there's less oxygen in the air. How's it, and maybe you've got to be a physiologist to explain to me how these athletes become champions from training in this yeah, high yeah. altitude. You, yes, you, you would need, there is a lot of physiology involved in explaining technically why high altitude training has an advantage. 1968, the Olympics were in Mexico City, 7,000 feet above sea level. That's where the East Africans first came to prominence, in a sense. So all the experts, all the uh, people doing analysis on the Olympics of 68 began to latch on to this idea, altitude must play a factor in middle and long distance running. Because they saw the success of the East Africans. So now we began to analyze and look at why, 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 why 10,000 meters, 5,000 meters, particularly long distance. Why, why have the East Africans done so well, the Ethiopians, the Kenyans? And then they began to realize through analyzing blood samples and looking at oxygen uptake that the, the rarity of the air, the lesser oxygen in the air meant that first of all, your system has to work harder. E10 is 8,000 feet above sea level, 2,400 meters. It's generally considered by physiologists and uh, athletic experts, we'll call them, to be kind of the, the optimum place of training, where you get the right balance between uh, the oxygen intake being uh, effective in your system and working against you if you went much higher or much lower. So it's around the optimum area. And that's why we, why people consider, so many people come to E10 to train and to other parts of the world who have uh, areas of altitude. You know more about David than anybody. Tell me about his training program. Is he still yeah. motivated? Can he win the gold at Rio? Uh, well, coaches are always cautious, especially me. I'm, I'm always a little bit on the conservative side when I come to predictions. But knowing David for the past almost 12 years, uh, from the time he was a primary school kid, 
I've grown up with him in a sense. I have grown as a coach while he grew as an athlete. So we've got to know each other very, very well. And we're not just only talking about his running ability, we're talking about his personality and his character and his commitment and the great guy that he is. And he has now kind of risen to the top of the pile when it comes to world athletics. And David is somebody that I have, uh, we have lived our lives together in a sense. We've gone through the successes and the failures, the difficulties and, and the challenges. And David is somebody who uh, is a fantastic person. I, I will always be associated with David Rudisha because of his accomplishment. David is somebody who has gone through his own challenges in life. He has risen to, to the heights. And here comes the moment where the world record holder he smashed his world record, second time, three world records in all. Daniel Rhodesia, 140.91, he toured the 800 metres. Wow, oh, a truly great athlete. Just a few times in any generation you have an athlete you can say that about. He has also been down and out in a sense of, of disappointments. Rhodesia beaten again. Not good enough, not fast enough, not hard enough, perhaps not quite fit enough. The great thing about David, I think, in the past and looking at his, his, the history of his, his career in athletics, that he's able to rise, he's able to pull himself up by his bootstraps and, you know, he's gone through injuries before and I'm sure that, uh, that, that what he has learned over the last couple of years will be put to good effect to motivate him going into Rio. Now, London was special. Can he repeat London? You know, I suppose the fact that the Olympics were in London, uh, the occasion, the night itself, David's uh, lead up to the Olympics, uh, the performances he had, um, the motivation, the, the pressures, the expectations, and then coming out and the performance. Can he ever repeat that? Very difficult. So people often say to me, uh, you know, are you going to find another Rudisha? He's, he's, he's one in a million, one in Kenya, 40 million. <laughs> you know, you don't find a Rudisha around the corner every day. He's a very, very special person. And I'm looking forward now over the next eight months or so, preparing him and uh, re-motivating him. People often say, you won the Olympics, you set a world record, what more is there for you? What more can you achieve? How can you pull another motivating factor out of the hat <laughs> in Rio? David is also the consummate championship runner, as we saw from Beijing last year. So coming up to Rio, we'll, 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 we'll have to really very carefully, very shrewdly prepare him. In 2012, you went with David back to Ireland they gave you a doctorate. You can be so proud of what you achieved. <laughs> For me, I suppose, working here, uh, I never set out to become a kind of a superstar or iconic in terms of, of coaching and the athletes uh, that I've helped. And all of them, I, I think I, I, I would like to have thought that I not only produced, we'll say, great athletes, but great people. You know, people who have made a contribution to the country, to the continent, to their communities, people who have lifted the spirits of the youth and become role models for our, our young people, you know. And in a sense, that's what I was really more proud of than maybe the just, just the individual achievement of winning Olympic gold medals, that I produced better people and not just only better athletes. You are an extraordinary, unique and great achiever. I think your story is unbelievable. We congratulate you. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to, I mean, that has motivated me to keep going. There's maybe another David Vidish around the corner. Uh, and I, I look forward to, to continuing sharing with the, with the local people the, 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 my enthusiasm and my interest. And uh, I thank the people of Kenya for giving me the opportunity. And I'm humbled by the fantastic achievements and the experiences of my athletes. David, take me through a normal day's training schedule. Our normal session is just three times, morning, easy, and then main call session is at 10, and then in the evening just flexibility and uh, uh, core exercises to strengthen our, 
our core muscles. Yeah. David, when you're not training or racing around the world, back home, how do you occupy yourself? Well, um, mostly, you know, I also get time with my family. You know, I have kids and, uh, and my wife, so sometimes we go out. But whenever um, um, my rural home where I was born, in 2010 actually is whereby uh, my age was graduating from uh, you know, uh, being uh, mor moran, meaning graduating from uh, being a young boy to a middle uh, man, whereby now you take a lot of responsibility, you know, with the society and all this. So at that particular time, uh, during that special time, uh, there is a rite of passage whereby uh, that group has to kill a lion. And whoever killed the lion is now their leader. And because at that same time, it was around August, that was the time that was happening back there. And I was out there in Europe breaking the war records in Berlin uh, and Rieti. That was the same time they were doing that. So, of course, when they had the news, then they say, this is our, is our age group, and I think uh, by him breaking two war records in a span of one week is even more than killing a lion. So they say, I'll be their elder, and uh, I accept it. So sometimes when I go back home, you know, these uh, young men, they come to me and uh, they come seek for advice on how to go with life, and uh, we associate and we relax with them. So it's quite fun uh, out there. David, August this year, the Olympics, are you confident you can win gold again? Well, actually, um, we are doing our best here, and uh, our training so far is good. We have no problems, and uh, that's always uh, positive. And uh, we know when we have good training, there's no much to worry about. I can't say I'm going to win, because uh, that uh, will be not be a little bit disrespecting to what others are doing because I think in the final of any competition everybody can win that race because you never know what might happen during that competition and that's why it is called a competition and whenever uh, we are in that line uh, there is no winner until you cross that line so I'm doing my best to cross that line in Rio uh, in August that's the first person. David, in conclusion, you remain the only athlete to have broken one minute, 41 seconds for the 800 meters. You've run the three fastest of all time, six of the eight fastest, and 10 of the 20 fastest 800 meters ever recorded. For me, it's been an absolute privilege and honor to have met you on behalf of all South Africans, I'm sure everybody in Africa, we wish you every success in Rio. You've had an extraordinary career, and we in Africa are very proud of your achievements. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you.